Well, tonight we are in Colossians chapter 1, and I know what you're thinking. That's where we were last week, and the week before that, and the week before that. Well, it's all right. We are concluding chapter 1 tonight, and we're going to be looking specifically at verses 24 through 29. And then we're going to get into chapter 2, and the book will gain momentum as we move forward together. The title of our series through the book of Colossians is Complete in Christ. Complete in Christ. And we're reminded in these times that are uncertain for the church. So, so Paul is sitting in prison right now, all right, and he's writing this letter to a church in Colossae. So, so this is a, a, a small city. This is a city that used to carry a big name, but it has shrunk in size and popularity. But what we know is that we're dealing with Rome. All right, so when we talk about the Colossians, when we talk about the church in Colossae, we're still in Rome because remember, Rome rules the world. They rule from India to England. Their scope is massive. And for so many people, what we need to realize, because this is a good thing, as a Christian, you might be thinking, Rome, bad. Rome is a bad thing. Because we have evil rulers that put Christians to death. And we certainly see that in 64 AD, that, that Christians are rounded up and they're thrown in the Colosseums. They're fed to lions. They're forced to fight for their life. And it's easy to come to the conclusion that Rome, in our mind as a Christian, is a bad thing. But here, when this letter is written to this church in Colossae, they are tempted to believe something else. They are tempted to believe that, that Rome isn't bad, but in fact, Rome is the light. Rome is salvation because for the world that was in chaos, Rome civilized it. They civilized the world with their government, with their politics, with their laws. They brought civilization into the world. So for so many people, to be a citizen of Rome was a good thing. And it meant that you had protection under Roman authority. But the problem is, and the reason that Paul's sitting in prison, it's not because he went to the, to the grocery store one day. And, and he began to share Jesus and tell them that, you know what, you are a sinner. This is what sin means. But God has sent his son Jesus, because he loves you and he has died for you, All right? Nobody would have a problem with that message in Rome. In fact, Rome was very tolerant of a message like that. See, Rome didn't care who you worshipped. Rome cared about who you did not worship. Right, so if you were a Roman citizen, if you were going to live in Roman peace, you had to worship Caesar. You had to worship their king as Lord, as God. But Paul is pleading with the church and he's reminding them, I know times are uncertain and I know the world is a scary place. But our citizenship is in heaven and our Lord is Jesus Christ, not Caesar. And he was preaching the message that Caesar is not Lord, but Jesus is Lord. That there is no other kingdom. There is no other rule that matters but the coming of kingdom of Jesus Christ. And that was the message that landed Paul in prison. That was the message where he ended up spending most of his life as a Christian, in and out of prison, receiving brutal beatings, and then released only to get arrested once again for disturbing the peace with the hope of the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. So this is what we're looking at, and this is why it's so important to realize that the main point in the book of Colossians, if you were going to take away one principle, one key phrase. This would summarize it all. The book of Colossians was written so that we would be confident in Christ's control and complete in Christ alone. 
That's why Colossians was written. That that you would know that Rome isn't in control over all, but Christ is in control over all. And that we are complete as Christians in Christ alone. That we shouldn't add anything to the simplicity of the gospel and the grace of God given to us through Jesus. This is what the letter of Colossians is all about. And and I love this because we've been using this image of a puzzle because I I, I see this illustration playing out like nowhere else in Scripture, although we see it in Scripture and especially in Paul's writings. But nowhere is it more clear that we see there's this paradox, there's this thing that takes place in the believer's life where we know that salvation's a one-time experience. We know that the moment we are saved, it's done. It's finished. But sanctification or growing in our relationship with Christ, it's an everyday experience. It's an everyday exchange. It's a a process. So what we see is, is that our position in heaven is we have been qualified by the finished work of Jesus Christ and we stand before him holy, blameless, and complete. So we've been using this idea of a puzzle because if we look at a puzzle and we're going to piece together a a puzzle, uh, what we know is we start with the image on the box. And the image on the box is complete. It's whole. And our position as a Christian, as a child of God, is that of one who is complete. The image that God sees when he looks at us, if you are a believer in Jesus, is he sees you as whole and complete. That's your heavenly position. And it was granted to you by the free gift of eternal life. All right? But what we know is the Christian life is messy and it's a process All right, it's an everyday practice. And it's easy to look at all the pieces of the puzzle that are not complete. And we look at the pile and we start to measure our worth based off of how much progress we've made. And the encouragement in the book of Colossians is that God is looking for participation. He desires practice. He doesn't expect perfection. Or he doesn't expect perfection because you've been given the perfection of Christ. And when we see that and we understand that truth, it empowers us, it motivates us to keep putting the pieces of the puzzle together. That we don't just take God's grace for granted, but we realize that God's grace guides us to repentance, that God's grace guides us to practice what we believe. And this is what we see in the book of Colossians in the main theme. The title of our message tonight is Not a Typo, Not a Typo. Now, I've shared with you guys before that I'm not good at math, all right? I've shared some embarrassing stories that illustrate how true that is for me, all right? But this shouldn't surprise you. It's not just math that I'm bad at, all right? In fact, I'm sure you've caught at least one typo on my PowerPoint, all right? At least one, one misspelled word, because when it comes to spelling, I'm not the best. I'm pretty bad at it, all right? When it comes to grammar, I still struggle, and you will find typos. You will find mistakes, in my presentation. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and use this as an opportunity because I'm going to be honest before you, and that's what I want to do. I want to say that I'm continuing to uh, do my best to honor God and be faithful to the text, but I'm growing and I'm learning and I'm going to make mistakes. And I've already identified one major mistake that I've already made. So one of the first things I told you on the very first message I taught is I said that the book of Philippians is the only book that Paul wrote where he identifies himself as a servant. That is not true. In the book of Philemon, he identifies himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus or as a servant 
of Christ, all right? He also identifies himself in the book of Romans as a servant and an apostle, all right? And he does this as well in Titus. So, do you guys forgive me? All right. So we're continuing to learn, we're continuing to grow, and it serves my illustration that I'm going to make mistakes, you're going to find typos in my work, but here's what I find incredible about our message tonight. Paul is going to write some things that sound like mistakes. He's going to write down some things that sound like typos, and we're going to think to ourselves, no, Paul, that can't be. I mean, how can you really say that? You must be looking for another word. You must be looking for a different phrase. Because tonight, what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about suffering. We're going to be talking about suffering. But before I make you suffer through this message, I want to share with you a funny story. I'm not the only one that's prone to making typos. In fact, uh, maybe you've walked into these doors and that you've picked up one of these little pieces of paper that we know as, what are these? Bulletins, right? So we all know what a bulletin is. And and I I found this humorous story about real-life typos or mistakes that have been in bulletins. And I find them quite humorous and I want to share them with you. This isn't from our bulletin, just to clarify, we have never made any mistakes in our bulletins. No, this is from other bulletins. All right, first one. Today, the pastor will preach his farewell message, after which the choir will, will, break, will sing Break Forth into Joy. Second one. Miss Charlene Mayweather saying, I will not pass this way again, giving obvious pleasure to the congregation. (laughs) The choir will meet at the Larson House for fun and sinning. (laughs) Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a good chance for you to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husband's. This one's good. This is the last one. Weight watchers will meet at 7 a.m. Please use the large double doors at the side entrance. (laughs) So those are a few examples where we're reminded we are human. We're going to make mistakes. Typos will happen. We will misspeak. But Paul wants us to know today that suffering is not a typo. Suffering in the Christian life is not a typo. It's not a mistake. But in fact, God wants to use suffering for a very specific purpose, and we could even see God bringing glory to himself through it. So the first thing we see in our text in verse 24 is we're going to look at Paul's reaction. Paul's reaction. He says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and filling up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. So so think about that. Paul's He's addressing us tonight, and he wants to start by saying, I rejoice in my suffering. I rejoice in my affliction. I rejoice in my imprisonment. Right? If I'm honest before you, I'm using a different word, and I'm taking that word rejoice, and I'm saying that's a typo. That's got to be an error. That has to be a mistake, right? I I could see if he would have said, I now complain in my sufferings, right? I I could see him say, I now 
anguish or I even weep. But that's not what he says. He says, I rejoice. I have reason to be happy in my suffering. So, so how can it be? How can it be that, that Paul the Apostle here, what he's telling us is that we can rejoice in our suffering. Well, we're reminded that for the Christian, joy is unique because it's not defined by our circumstances. It's not defined by our circumstances. And here's what I mean by that. So happiness comes from things going our way. That's just the way happiness works. When things go your way, you're happy. When they don't go your way, you're unhappy. That's how it works for me. That's how it works for you. For joy, it's unique because for the Christian, we can have joy because we trust and we believe. We know that things are going God's way. That things are going God's way. And because things are going God's way, we have reason to rejoice. We have reason to be happy. Right? There's pleasure in knowing that God is in control and he's over all. The second typo that I want to address before we move on is it would appear that Paul is saying somehow he's adding to the finished work of Jesus Christ. That somehow his suffering for the church is helping to atone for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. At first glance, it would be easy to come to that conclusion. All right, but here's what you need to understand. He's not talking about atoning to the finished work of Jesus Christ. He's talking about adding to the church. He's talking about how his suffering displays the cross and the finished work of Jesus Christ. And by that display, when he rejoices in his suffering, people are attracted and drawn to the gospel. And his church grows and is added to. Right, so he's not talking about mortifying his flesh for the sake of the gospel. He's talking about multiplication. The multiplication of the gospel through his suffering. So, so that's what we're talking about. Those are the first two things at glance that look like typos but are pretty easy to clear up. See, this is the same man who wrote Romans 8.28. You may have this on a shirt. You may have it on a coffee cup. Maybe it's a painting in your house. It says, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. All right, so, so how can the same man who wrote this hold the perspective that I rejoice that God is in control? Because what he's saying is God is in control, Romans 8, 28, that he works all things for good, right? But for us, it's easy to read that and say, yeah, but, but good means good, and prison is bad. All right, good means that God gives us the desires of our hearts, not that God leads us into prison and we suffer beatings for his name. All right, think about it. Paul has done nothing wrong. He's done everything that God has expected of him. He's done everything right. But this same man writes this passage, and what we need to know is that word good isn't the same word that we would understand it to be, all right? So the best replacement would be benefit, that God works all things for our benefit, that whatever benefits you to drive you towards salvation and to compel you in your sanctification, that's what's best for us. That's what's best for me, and that's what's best for you. And God is working all things for good. You see, if we're honest, if we didn't understand this puzzle is complete, if we put the pieces together, we could look at the pile and I could find shapes and pieces that I don't like. They're not appealing to me. For whatever reason, I might say, you know what? I like this piece right here, but this piece, no, I don't like that piece. 
That's a bad piece, and that's a good piece. But the reality is God brings us the good, and he brings us the bad, and he calls it for our benefit. That's what God is doing, and that's what Romans 8.28 means. That's why it's an encouraging promise, and that's why he can say, I rejoice in my sufferings. The takeaway for us tonight is that pain has the potential to be used for our profit and God's praise. That pain in the believer's life, suffering in the believer's life, trial and tribulation in the believer's life has the potential, the potential to be used for your profit and God's praise. And this is the main point of our passage tonight. This is Paul's main point, and he sees this so clearly. He sees it so clear that he could confidently say, I rejoice in my suffering. And I see it as nothing but profit. And I'm going to use it for God's praise. You see, God in his sovereignty and his control over all things, he's strategically steering all things for the salvation and sanctification of his church. That's what he's doing. So, so whenever you're asking yourself, why, God, why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this? We could have confidence in saying God is in control. Right? There's no moment where God's driving and he says, oops. There is no oops in the vocabulary of God. There is no readjusting. There's no realigning. But we're confident that God in his control over all things is strategically steering all things for the salvation and sanctification of his church. So that's something to hold on to. That's something to remember because life is hard, but God is good. And God is working all things for our benefit. We see this in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, because what we see is that suffering has a purpose in our life. And we know that it serves the purpose of driving people to salvation, drawing people to salvation, because they realize that something's wrong with this world, that they can't find complete satisfaction in this world, that they must be made for something other than this world. All right, but also for the believer, when we talk about sanctification, in the book of James it says, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That's not what I did the last time I found myself suffering. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So even suffering in the believer's life produces growth. See, when time gets hard, when times get hard, when, when we find ourselves in trials, what I found in my own life, and this is where I'm going to start, you guys know and you've heard it before, that trials refine character. Have you heard that before? That's absolutely true. But what I found in my own life first is it reveals a lack of character. Right? Because when times get hard, I see where I lack. I see where I need to grow, and it drives me to dependence upon God. It leads me to a place where I have to ask and beg him for help. I have to ask and beg him for the desire to continue, the desire to be strengthened, the desire to be patient, and it produces perseverance and character in our life. And that is God's refining work of Christ-like character. That's what he's doing, and he reinforces that character through suffering. He reinforces that through the promises he gives us in his word, that we need to see ourselves, that we see our lives through the lens of his word and the promise of his word. So suffering serves a purpose, and Paul knew that, but he also knew that suffering is not a typo, but it's temporary, all right? So Suffering is not a typo, but it is temporary, okay? 
this, this is important because it answers some pretty big questions in my mind, and I hope that it answers some questions in your mind. All right, here's what I mean by that. So, Paul says, and he confirms this in, um, in the, well, first let's start with 2 Peter 3, 9, before we get into Paul. Because I love this example of God using it for his purpose of salvation. It says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So that goes back to the purpose of suffering. Why is Jesus taking so long to return? Because we know with the coming reign and rule of Christ, he's going to bring peace. He's going to bring shalom, that he's going to fix this broken world, that there will be no suffering anymore. And it's easy to ask ourselves, well, why doesn't he just do that now? Well, we're reminded the purpose of suffering is to provide time for all to hear and respond to the gospel. That it serves a purpose. But we're also reminded that it's temporary, meaning that it serves a sentence. So suffering serves a sentence, and it's a short sentence in comparison to eternity. When you compare the here and now and our present suffering in light of eternity, it's a short sentence. And we see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. How, how heavy is that? And what a beautiful reminder that Christ is coming. And with his return, he will bring shalom. He will bring peace. And there will be no more suffering. But for now, suffering serves a purpose and it serves a sentence. And the sentence is short and light of eternity. So the question that we should ask is not why do we suffer? The question is how much longer will we suffer? How much longer will we suffer? All right, it's important to note that suffering is not a result of God. All right, it doesn't come from God. We know that suffering is a result of our sin, our rebellion against God. That in Genesis chapter 3, suffering entered the world that was once perfect because we disobeyed and rebelled against God. And if you want to trace most of the suffering in this world, it comes down to people still living out this self-seeking, self-desire that we are born with that will do anything at the cost of others. All right? And we're all born with that curse. We're all born with this sinful desire to put ourselves first and to live a self-centered life. And when we live a self-centered life, we hurt other people around us. That's how it works. And that's where suffering comes from. It's a result of sin. But God uses it as a resource for salvation. God uses it as a resource for our salvation. The second thing we see in verse 25 is Paul's rank. To put it simply, he says this. He says, of which I became a minister or a servant of the gospel according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. See, I love this because Paul reminds us that he is able to exercise humility before God because he understands his past. He understands where he came from and what God has saved him from. And, and, and from a human perspective, it's kind of surreal because what we know about the Apostle Paul is he was pretty well off before Jesus met him. Right? He was doing pretty good. He was highly educated. He probably received a pretty good paycheck. He was liked by his community. So he had fame. Right? We don't know if he had a fortune, but we know that he had some kind of living from the life that he had before Jesus. But when he met Jesus... He was so radically transformed that God changed his name from Saul to Paul, which means little, that God made him little. And God, he remembers where he came from. And I, this, is, this is crazy because I, I think we miss this. I, I miss this. I miss this in Acts chapter 9. So if you were in Sunday school, 
and you are coloring the page of, of Saul riding his donkey on the road to Damascus, you probably missed this part. Right? This is what Acts chapter 9 says in verses 15 through 16. And this is talking, this is the Lord talking to Ananias. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go for he is chosen. Speaking of Paul. He's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I missed that part in Sunday school. See, Paul knew that in his life it would involve suffering. And I'm sorry if you ever heard a sermon, I know you haven't heard it here because Pastor Tom is very faithful to the word of God, but I'm sorry if you've heard a sermon that made it sound like your life was going to get easier when you became a Christian. I apologize because the only problem with that idea of having enough faith and God will give you the wealth you need, he'll give you the health you want, and he'll give you that life you're looking for, the only way or problem I have with that is when we look at the Bible, right? I mean, it sounds good. It sounds really good that somehow you could put God in your favor, that somehow if you read your Bible every morning, if you invite people to church, if you serve as an usher, if you serve in the children's ministry, then, then God will make sure that you always have money in your bank account. God will always make sure that you are healthy. God will always make sure that you get the desires of your heart. The problem with that theology, with that idea of God is it's a lie, from Satan. It's a lie because when we look at the word of God, we know that even Paul knew we're promised suffering. Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble for the name of Jesus, for his sake. The third thing we see is Paul's revelation, and he speaks of this in verse 26 he says, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. He's speaking of Jesus fulfilling the prophecies and the promises of God from the Old Testament. He was saying, hey, I, I know we were looking to a Messiah, but the Messiah has come, and he's Lord over all, and his name is Jesus. That these things were a mystery before, but now it's been revealed through Jesus. We see this in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That picture of Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father is that of authority and being in control over all. And it says right there that, that he holds all things together. He holds the, he holds the molecules. He holds, he holds every, the matter, the, everything that, that we understand just a little bit of when it comes to the workings of the universe. He holds those together by the word of his, of his mouth, by the power of his hand. That's the size of the Son of God. That's the size of the Lord. Number four, in closing, we see Paul's reason. Paul's reason is given to us. Why would he suffer? Why was he given this revelation? Why was he given this calling as a minister of Christ? Why would he react in this way of joy? The reason is in verses 27 through 29. He said, to them, the church, God willed to make known what are the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving or working hard. That word literally is agonizing according to his working, which works in me mightily. Why? What's the reason? Paul would say, so that you might know God, that you might grow in his grace, and that you might show his glory. That's why. And he says that it's the, the mighty power of God that works in him to do this. And, and I, don't, I don't know where you're at tonight. I, I know where I'm at. And if I'm honest before you, if you were looking at me tonight and you're thinking to myself, oh, okay, yeah, leave it to the young guy to talk about suffering. Right? What do you know about suffering? Right? You probably had great parents. I heard you grew up in the church. What do you know about suffering? And you would be right. You'd be absolutely right. All of my suffering that I've experienced up to this point has simply been growing pains. Just growing pains. It's part of growing up. But the question is never, am I going to suffer? But when am I going to suffer? And I was terrified in preparing this message because that's a reality for all of us. And we need to pray that when that hour comes, we might say, God, be my strength. God, be enough because I can't do this. Have you guys ever heard that phrase, God never gives you more than you can handle? I can't find that in scripture. I can't. I know that God doesn't give us an amount of temptation that we can't overcome, but trials and temptation, that's not the same word. Again, trials were purposed to drive us to the cross. The purpose is to drive home that we can't deal with this on our own, that we can't handle this by ourselves. But we need the power and strength of God to stand. And that's the promise of God today, is that he's not going to lead you to something that he won't lead you through. He's going to lead you through it. And it makes God look unbelievably valuable to the world when he's enough. Because anybody would want a God that gives you a new BMW every year. Anybody would want a, a God who gives you that, that house that you couldn't afford but you were able to get into. But at that point, they would just want the gifts of God. They wouldn't want the giver. And though we are certainly blessed by God and we get things all the time that we do not deserve, that are temporary blessings, when we suffer, it shoves, our light in the, it shoves our life into the spotlight. That's what it does. Suffering shoves your life into the spotlight so that everybody else sees it. It's on display. And people are watching us suffer and they're seeing what we're holding on to. What are you turning to? What's helping you get through that time of suffering. Because for the believer in Christ who has their hope in heaven and the hope of God dwelling in them, he is our strength. He is the one who sustains us and he's enough. And we need to be reminded of that. One of my favorite stories is about a pastor who decided that he was going to build his own deck. And I'm not handy, so I admire that, you know. So he was going to build his own deck and he was hammering away and he noticed that every day when he was working on his deck, the little neighbor boy would come over after school and he would sit on top of the fence and he would watch the pastor put together the deck. And then finally he got to the point where the pastor said, hey, are, are you trying to pick up some pointers? Do you want me to teach you how to swing a hammer? And he says, oh no, sir. I just want to see what a pastor says when he hits his thumb with a hammer. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> the, the point is, whatever the suffering is, whatever the pain is, whatever the affliction is, it's a platform to be used for God's praise that God might be enough. And my encouragement tonight is that he is enough. One of my all-time favorite quotes from Charles Spurgeon says, God is too good to be unkind, and he's too wise to be mistaken, and when we cannot trace his hand, we can trust his heart. When we cannot trace his hand, when we don't know what he's doing, when we can't see what he's up to, we could trust his heart and we can know with confidence that suffering serves a purpose and suffering serves a sentence. And it's temporary in light of eternity. So for us as Christians, we know that pain has the potential to be used for our profit and God's praise. Let's pray.